Hi, thank you for coming. Uh, so for my uh, thesis project, I a, uh, wrote a collection of short stories. Uh, so to begin, just some background information. <laughs> I don't think that's the right slide. I'm just going to skip ahead a few. I don't know what this is. <laughs> OK. I'm sorry about that. Uh, all right, so uh, for my project, uh, I, uh, I had set out to write, uh, I had aimed for maybe seven stories. I ended up with maybe uh, around four or three and one unfinished story. Um, but uh, they kind of range uh, in a uh, variety of subject uh, and uh, page length. Uh, the, the third story uh, ended up being a lot longer than I'd intended, so whereas the last one, the last one, the, uh, the last one, the brim was maybe like, 12, uh, 1,600 words, like five pages, whereas the hypothetical dinner date story was maybe 16,000, so that's more like 40 pages. So I ended up kind of, uh, it ended up disproportionate, but, um, so uh, for my presentation, I'm going to read an excerpt, uh, and I'm going to read from uh, the actual, the, the one story that I uh, did not title. Um, it is an excerpt, it's not the whole story, and uh, for, uh, as Charles had uh, referenced uh, in his opening remarks, it is um, erotic and irreverent. Um, <laughs> so just, just as, as fair warning. Uh, so, okay, without further, without further ado, I'm just gonna start reading. I apologize if I'm looking down. Retired NFL lineman Courtney Malkmus stood himself at arm's length behind Ayla. He looked her up and down. From beneath a black athletic skirt, her ass, tightly packed like a child's lunchbox, gently pulsated. God damn, he sighed in disbelief, to himself but loud enough for her to hear. He drank in the contour of her lower figure. Her hips swelled outward like a bell curve, slightly distorting all surrounding matter as if bending the very space-time continuum. Lord have mercy. In the sunlight, her brown hair looked red enough to be orange. She wore it parted down the middle and fastened at the sides into floppy pigtails, loosely plated with yellow ribbons fluttering just above her chest like tiny butterflies. And her chest, her breasts, her boobs. They weren't natural so much as they are believed to be supernatural. Believed, that is, to such an extent that the speculation of her nude form had taken on a cult-like fanaticism or rather, weren't natural so much as they were the stuff of whatever pre-existing force had inspired the creation of nature itself. Her tits, if revealed, would have challenged any plastic surgeon's standard of perfection, although they could be bigger, Malcolmus thought. He liked them bigger. <laughs> Malcolmus, a.k.a. Planet X, politely grabbed Ayla by the shoulders. She wore a white polo t-shirt turned halter top, sleeveless, with a winged collar at the neck. Her skin was soft and transluc translucent and sun-kissed with pink freckles. Like ball bearings only made of pearl, her shoulders rolled without friction against the inside of his large and calloused hands. Malcolmus looked like and was said to have the temperament of a grizzly bear, only pink-skinned and not as hairy. His high and tight crew, tight, crew, crew cut was so high and so tight that his blonde tuft of hair looked as if it might slide right off his scalp should he lean forward too fast. Like this, he said. As careful as any giant could be, he not so much inched forward but rather relaxed his gut as Ayla sank back into his belly fat as if he were a futon. Her sneakers disappeared behind his cleats. He wore black pleated slacks and a solid red polo t-shirt. Like Tiger Woods, he had intended, only three times as large. A yellow ribbon pinned to his chest. Ayla craned her neck and nearly suffocated on his stomach. She yelped playfully, as did the crowd that had gathered. One couldn't help but laugh at the sight of them. The porcelain Ayla Krasnyanskaya dwarfed in comparison to the mythically large Planet X. Up close, it was rumored, one could feel a sizable gravitational pull emanating from his midsection, hence the name. His permanently concussed head hung two heads above her own like a totem pole. His face, too, was totem-like and shaped as if constructed from toy blocks. She smelled like wax paper. God damn, Malcolmus went limp in the legs. He lurched forward, not by much, but suddenly, as if about to swoon. With caution, he held Ayla above the waist, but not before running his hands down her chest and pressing his thumbs into her aforementioned tits. With his rhinoceros weight, he leaned her forward, turned her left shoulder inward, and squared her off against the hull. From the knees, he said. She bent at the knees and choked down on the putter. She might as well have been sitting on Santa's lap, Ayla thought, only it wasn't Christmas, it was summer. 
The humidity turned everything that breathed into a living swamp. Malcolm's hot breath pulled on top of Ayla's head and canaled down the central part in her hair. His silver Indianapolis Colts belt buckle left a horseshoe-shaped sweat stain on the back of her shirt. Have mercy on my soul, he murmured, momentarily letting go of Ayla to cross his chest. Lord, have mercy on my soul. We love you, Ayla, yelled someone from the crowd. An entourage of young males decked in Colts jerseys waved footballs and glossy printouts of Ayla's, Ayla's glamour shots in the air, eagerly thrusting their budding erections and sharpie markers in her and Malcolm's general direction. A rope fence surrounded the green. From behind the fence, the fans shoved and elbowed one another like pigs to the trough. Many clung to last year's Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue, of which Ayla Krasninskaya, at 19 years of age, had become the youngest ever cover girl. A tremendous feat that in fairy tale fashion transformed the Russian cam girl into a sex symbol as world famous as she had once been cold and hungry. Ayla, over here. Ayla swiveled her head to the right and smiled. Her fans oohed and odd. It couldn't be helped, not in the face of such effortless beauty. And she was. Ayla Krasninskaya was without a doubt on any earthling's mind the most beautiful woman to ever walk the planet. The next big thing Ned had promised of a then unknown Ayla during his pitch, pre pitch presentation to Sports Illustrated. Ned, knock him dead Baumgartner, the heavy hitting talent agent responsible for discovering Ayla's online work, any record of which had since been erased from the internet, had skillfully won the unanimous vote of the off-divided swimsuit committee a five-person all-male council whose members were appointed by Congress to serve life terms. Thing being the optimal word, Ned continued, because that's what these supermodels are, things to look at, things to touch. The committee's wrinkled husks of men, as wealthy as they were near death, winked at one another from across their U-shaped bench. It was then that Ned removed the red cloth draped over the object of medium height breathing silently at his side. Gentlemen, I present to you the goddess Aphrodite herself, Ayla Krasninskaya. And to that, the committee had cheered raucously, such that two of its members had fallen over in their chairs and suffered heart attacks. One had survived, the other, Hal Hallwitt, the legendary maverick who during his daughter's ballet recital had coined the phrase, sex sells, died that night in his private hospital after losing a hallucinatory game of chess to the ghost of his childhood dog, Gus. <laughs> Ayla's Sports Illustrated spread, the steamy centerfold of which would replace Bob Marley as the number one staple to every male college student's dorm room poster collection, had been dedicated to the memory of Hal. Show us your game face, yelled a photographer from across the green. From a designated distance of 50 feet from Ayla at all times, and from a generally agreed upon distance of as far away from Malcolmus as possible, the press and paparazzi snapped away at what would become the front page image of every newspaper tomorrow morning. America's favorite supermodel, the obits would read. Ayla didn't think of herself as a supermodel, at least not at this early of a stage in her career. A model, most definitely, the next big thing, without a doubt. But what would it take, she often wondered, to get from the next big thing to the thing itself? Whatever radioactive spider she had to swat or medieval sword to pull from stone, or whichever Hollywood executive's penis she had to suck, not in a million years, she told herself, not if her career depended on it, the opportunity had yet to present itself. Show us how it's done. She couldn't help but notice how many news reporters and football fans there were, and how few of them appeared to be there in support of early childhood arts and music education. Or were they against it? Is that what the yellow ribbons were for? Were they for or against the arts? Or maybe it was cancer. Give it a shot, they yelled, sink the putt. Ayla wasn't stupid. It wasn't that she didn't care about charity. In fact, the opposite was true. She herself would have been a charity case had it not been for Ned. Nonetheless, she seldom spoke of her childhood up until and including the indentured servitude that became of her career in porn. She kept silent, not because her personal life didn't matter, but because it didn't matter to the people that mattered, the ones calling the shots. You're going to want to save the sob story until after your first slip up racial comment, what have you, Ned had advised her. That way you win them back. Holding on to the past, he argued, would keep Ayla from achieving supermodel status, that and her refusal to go nude for the camera. No, it wasn't that she didn't care. At the beginning of it all, a little more than a year ago, Ayla had made an unbreakable promise to herself. She would use her newfound celebrity to make the world a better place, to call attention to global issues of poverty and violence, such as she had dealt with during her childhood. That being said, after the public revelation of her Sports Illustrated cover, having skydived without a parachute into the American spotlight, Ayla could make neither heads nor tails of what charitable cause she was and wasn't sponsoring what carbonated beverage she was supposed to be endorsing, and which oil, oil tycoon's pool she had been paid to sit by and look sexy while drinking said beverage. Just show your face, Ned had told her. That's what matters. Come on, the crowd stirred. Hit the ball already. Golf was a gentleman's game. 
Ayla enjoyed golf. She was terrible at it, but you didn't have to be good at it to have fun. On the other hand, golfing alongside, or rather within reach of Courtney Malkmus, was anything but fun. When the pairings had been drawn that morning, at random, apparently, Ayla had recognized the name Planet X not from his long gone career in the NFL, but from the seedy billboards along the interstate for Planet XXX, Malkmus's combination strip club and barbecue ribs chain. <laughs> no napkins necessary was their slogan. It was probably Oren's doing sticking her with Malkmus. Such an excessive means of punishment had Oren's name on it, as did the golf course. This was, after all, Efren and Downs, the Efren and Downs, rated by Golf Digest as among the top five most exclusive golf courses in the United States, the other four also having been designed by celebrity architect, famous recluse, and secret ex-lover of Ayla's, Oren Efrenin. It even smelled like him, the golf course, like Neosporin. Golf scapes, Oren would have corrected her. I design golf scapes. Courses are for failing. You fail trigonometry. One doesn't fail an Efrenin. And what had she done to deserve such torture? Malcolmus by now had dug his fingers into each and every curve and crevice along Ayla's body. She neither egged on nor discouraged him, knowing all too well that the only thing worse than yes was to say no. Earlier, Malcolmus had nearly penetrated her with a golf tee, and since then, Ayla simply skipped teeing off altogether. Instead, because no one else seemed to mind, she would toss her ball at random on the green for an easy putt. Only it wasn't so easy, was it? That's the end of the thing I'm reading. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, uh, how am I doing on time? How am I doing? Okay. Uh, so I guess just open up for questions, but before that, a uh, big thank you to uh, my advisor, Professor Zatlin, all of my professors. Uh, thank you to KG, KG Planning Committee, uh, all my friends. Thank you, uh, thank you, Chad. Thank you, Maggie. Everyone who read my stories and gave me feedback, Ceci or something. Um, thank you. Um, yeah. So, any questions, Jacob? Yeah. Um, so I don't know. Just strikes me in a lot of ways, but you know, I, I think it like harkens to a certain time in writing or certain people that we think of writing in terms of like their commentary, like social mm -hmm. commentary. I just wonder like how, what the contemporary sources of literature that you really turn to, are you just creating it because there isn't anything right now that's like filling that void for you or for our community? Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure if there's a particular author or genre who I read and then decided I would like to contribute to this, um, you know, uh, uh, literary, uh, community, but certainly after I've written, and then you read other authors I've read, you know, you read David Foster Wallace or Jonathan Franz and people in the kind of contemporary comic fiction uh, genre, uh, I definitely realized, oh, okay, this is perhaps what I'm a part of, if that answers your question. Just like comic fiction. I would say, yeah. 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 Which is always like much more piercing and real. Than yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> it's, yeah, like yeah. Yeah, yeah. What made you pick creative writing as the medium that you wanted to go through, given that, like, I know that you weighed a couple of ideas and also like, mm -hmm. experience in film, and there was, like, graphic novels. Yeah, yeah. I mean, first and foremost, I've always been interested in writing, which is why I got into, I'm a film and television major. Um, and I kind of gave this spiel at the KHC Open House the other day, speaking to incoming students, but I saw this as an opportunity to do something I wouldn't have done uh, in com. Um, and so I, I never, uh, I've always wanted to uh, do this. So yeah, uh, another question? Zach. Yeah, in your reading, you devoted a really, really long, long amount of time to the female perspective. I was just curious, uh, was it easy for you to write from that perspective? What sort of sources did you draw on and how consistent was it necessarily with the perspectives of women that you perhaps spoke to? Um, it's a really good question and something that I, I was really, uh, hesitant about reading out loud. Um, and I'm sure I'd love to hear from men and women alike um, afterward uh, about what you thought. Um, but uh, more so than being, it being from a female perspective and it being about sex and then uh, sexual abuse, it's, I think, uh, well on that note, I think sex is something, whether it's the act or the idea of it or just physical appearance and beauty is something that we're all so consumed with. Um, and so I think I took my own personal fears, anxieties, whatever that is, 
and just put them in a female voice. Sound pretty sexy. <laughs> Uh, I think that's about all the time I have. Thank you. <laughs>